for sure. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about um, uh, the economics of happiness. Um, what I'm going to present you the, the really the ink bottle of this uh, research uh, domain and what main lessons we can draw uh, concerning uh, digital economy. So what we do is we, we don't try to f decide on for ourselves what happiness is about. We ask people how happy they are. We ask people how satisfied with their life they are, how they feel, how they felt yesterday or last week. Did they feel happy, relaxed, or stressed and angry? And then we relate, we correlate these measures, self-declared measures, with the circumstances of people's life, and we try to understand what makes, what makes a person declare a higher level of happiness today than one year ago, or how comes this person declares a higher level of happiness than that person. So each person has its own like, its own cooking of happiness, and we then try to understand what the recipe is. Okay, so these are the questions that uh, have been introduced in large surveys of the population nationally and internationally, and trying to and showing the structure of happiness. And for instance, the, um, the National Statistical Office of, uh, of the UK is uh, surveying 200,000 people every year, asking a lot of questions, uh, in particular, the life satisfaction question, the happiness question, and also a question about anxiety, more emotional, short run, and a question about meaningless of, of, of life. Does what you do in life, is it worthwhile? And I think the next the next step is to relate this uh, subjective well-being, uh, self-declared variables with what we can learn from big data. This is uh, relating with um, uh, digital dec um, technology. So looking at, for instance, at what people, s the, the Google trends, what people search, and try to identify the, the keywords that people sh look for when they are happy, and the keywords that people typically look for when they are unhappy. And then once we have identified this, we can build, um, uh, we can now cast happiness by region, by groups of the population, by, by, by type of consumer, uh, consumers, um, and have high frequency data on happiness, which is not the case with surveys because surveys are run uh, once a year. Okay. So what do, th what do we do in this research domain? Many things, but I'm just going to talk about one, which is really the reason why this domain expanded uh, from the start. So it goes back to the Easterlin paradox. Easterlin is a professor of economics at the uh, University of South California. He's going to retire this year. He must be 95. Uh, he's still working and publishing. So he's going to have a big conference uh, this year uh, in, in the honor of uh, Easterlin. And Easterlin asks, uh, is raising the incomes of all gonna make, go going to increase the happiness of all? And he's been repeatedly showing that the answer is no. So it's called the Easterlin paradox. But the, it's, not, it's a paradox not because the answer is no, it's also a paradox because depending on the way you look at the data, you get a different answer. If you look at the, the relationship between uh, uh, income and happiness within a country, you always find that richer people declare a higher level of happiness than poorer people. So on this graph, each line is a country. So on the left, you have poorer people, and on the right, income increases, and you see that there is a, there is a gradient, a positive gradient, the, the, the richer, the, the, the happier. Of course, if you look at the, at the graph um, uh, with, uh, cautiously, you also notice that, okay, there's a relationship between uh, income and happiness, but there is also something cultural. I'm not going to talk about today, but look, you can see that Brazil, for instance, this is leather, yeah. Look at Brazil. Brazil uh, derives a much higher level of happiness for, uh, for, the, same type, for the same level of, uh, of, uh, of income. So but Brazilians are happier, uh, no matter what, uh, for than, 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 uh, I don't know, than Ukrainian, for instance, uh, if they have the same income. Okay, the next thing is that mm -hmm, people who live in uh, rich countries declare a higher level of happiness than people who live in poor countries. You have this typical type of uh, relationship. When you go out of poverty, you are much more happy. Then as you continue growing, you become more and more happy, but at, at a slower pace. It's a concave relationship like for everything in life. It's great in the beginning, then it goes on being nice, but less... Uh, you know, with a slower pace, okay? Then people are very sensitive to the business cycle. The happiness of people is very sensitive. So here, what do you see? You see the Standard & Poor uh, Index during the big crisis uh, on the one axis, and on the other axis, you have the average happiness declared by Americans in the uh, Gallup uh, poll, which is uh, surveying 1,000 Americans every day. And you see how parallel these two, uh, these two lines are. Uh, but finally, when you look on the long run, you look at two points in time which are very different, like 30 years, and you measure average income per inhabitant 
at the start and at the, at, the, at the end, and then income per inhabitant has been multiplied by two, let's say, like here, and you also measure the average happiness of the same inhabitants, and the trend is flat. So this is the, the Italian paradox. And every, you know, most of the papers that have been written in this domain start from this paradox, you know, why is it the case that you can't raise the happiness of people on the long run? And it's also very strange because this means that uh, if you are a, a poor country and you are embarking on a development project, uh, you can't promise the population that they are going to be more happy in a 30 years' time because the happiness trend is flat. So there's like a, a mismatch between the short run and the long run. It's very difficult to understand. Okay, so you have the same type of... Um, you can draw this uh, long run, no trend for the United States, for Europe, for any country. So how can it be? Uh, the first reason is maybe there is something behavioral, like psychological, loss aversion. So the economy is growing, but with ups and downs, a business cycle. But there is something like loss aversion. So people are much more sensitive to a loss than to a gain. So when the economy is growing, people are feeling better, and the economy is receding, people are feeling much worse. They don't like volatility. And this is why when the economy is growing, happiness is going up, and when there is a recession, happiness is going down, but much more. And in the end, when you draw the line of happiness, it's flat. So maybe part of the reason why uh, growth is not making people happy is because growth is too volatile. And here, maybe digital economy can do something by improving uh, you know, forecasts, uh, provisions, um, insurance, like uh, was uh, shown previously. Maybe there is a role to play but for the digital economy, uh, you know, smoothing this, uh, these cycles. The other reason, the second reason, is adaptation. We adapt to everything. So, for instance, uh, when, you, when you ask, there was a, the Leiden School, so I'm talking about this today. So th the first people who were thinking about that were uh, researchers at the, uh, the Leiden School, Bernard von Prague, von Herwarden. They introduced this minimum income question in their surveys. What is the minimum income that you need to be in, in order to be able to uh, make meet, uh, ends meet? Taking everything into account. And what they observed is that when your uh, income increases by 100 uh, florins at the time, uh, within two years, the minimum income that you, didn't, you, you judged necessary to make ends meet had increased by 60, uh, 60 florins. So there is like an evaporation of 60% of the useful effect of income over time because of adaptation. And this is why Easterlin concludes that people project uh, their aspirations to be the same over the life cycle, but the problem is that aspirations move along with attainments. And what really makes happiness is the difference between what you have and what you aspire to. So if your aspirations go up with what you have, then the gap is never going to re be reduced, so you're never going to be, uh, uh, never going to increase, so you're never going to get any happier, okay? So if this is the case, then you work a lot to, 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 you know, to increase uh, material wealth, and you hope to be uh, happier thanks to that, but it's not the case. So the choices that people make turn out to be false and based on false expectations, which is really a radical criticism to uh, uh, economics and even to the, uh, you know, the way society is organized. Okay, so can digital economy help for that? Uh, in what way is it going to influence adaptation? Maybe digital economy is making people more impatient because it works so well and so fast. We're used to having everything you know, on a click now. So maybe it will uh, worsen the problem of adaptation. Maybe on the contrary, digital economy is moving so fast that people have uh, difficulties to, uh, to follow and, um, and it will go on the... On the uh, I don't know how, what the consequence will be. Um, so, and maybe, again, if the problem is that people make wrong expectations, they believe that, uh, that uh, you know, buying a bigger house will make them happy, maybe with everything we learn from with the big data now, maybe it will again improve their capacity to, to form their expectations. Okay. Okay, the, the, the third explanation is, is that everything is related. People don't really care about the level of what they have, the level of consumption, the size of their house. Uh, they just care about the difference with some relevant benchmark, which can be other people, the reference group, maybe your, your, your colleagues, maybe your former schoolmates, maybe uh, your brother-in-law, so your reference group. And again, the only thing that matters is the difference between what you have and what that relevant other has, uh, relative uh, comparisons. And this may be true not only for humans, but also for uh, everybody. So she gives a rock to us, that's the task. And an we give her a piece of cucumber and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. 
and she gets a grape. And she, she, the other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. She tests a rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. So jealousy may be the reason. Because if the only thing that matters is the gap, then Going back to Easterlin's question, will raising the incomes of all increase the happiness of all? Well, no, because if everybody's income increases in the same way, then the gaps remain unchanged and happiness remains unchanged. If so, the, the incomes of certain person go up and certain person go down, some people will be more happy, other people will be less happy, but in average, it's a zero-sum game. So this could be the, the, the interpretation. So now I'm going to talk to you about two case studies of this, uh, two, two evidence of these income comparisons related with the digital uh, technology. The first one is a, is a study made by some um, professors in uh, Californian universities, and it's a controlled experiment at the workplace. So the idea is that it's, it's always been the case that the uh, salaries of, public, um, of civil servants were to be uh, public information in California, but the thing is that it really became public information when it was put, put on the website in, uh, in 2008, uh, on the website of a journal in California called Sacramento Bee website. And so these guys, these professors, had the idea of running an experiment. So you can go on this website and look at the, the wage of uh, anybody, like uh, Emmanuel Saez, for instance, who is of French uh, origin, and you can see his wage over time, the base wage, the total wage. You can see the wage of uh, the pe person who, is, who has a higher pay in the department, the average pay in the department, the median, anything ju just on a click. So it becomes completely transparent. So what they did is uh, they, they, um, they got the information uh, on the, the payroll of uh, three universities, uh, 6,000 people, they randomly dis um, divide this uh, group into two, the treatment group and the control group. The treatment group, they send a message to them. Uh, in the first place, they say, hi, we're a group of um, professors in economics, we're uh, studying um, a wage. We just want to ask you a question. Are you aware of the existence of this website where you can look up the wage of uh, anybody who works in the public sector in California? Yes? No. And the control group, they don't receive any message. Then they come back to 10 days later, and they survey the entire sample, the control group and the, the treatment group. And they know everybody about these guys because they match the data with the administrative data. And then, the, these 10 days later, they just ask uh, them to fill a questionnaire. How satisfied are you with your wage on this job? How satisfied are you with this job? Do you agree that the wages are set fairly in your department? Uh, and how likely is it that you will make a genuine effort to find a new job within next year? And then they analyze the data, and they should find, of course, that people who have sent, received the message in the first place, they went to the website, they looked for the wages of people in their department, and those who find out that they earn less than the median wage in their department, they're really dissatisfied. Uh, much more dissatisfied than the same people who also earn less than the medium in the department, but did not receive the information and are just not aware. So just becoming aware that you earn less than the others makes you really dissatisfied. So it's really causal. It's not because you are dissatisfied, so you compare. It's really, you get the information and, and really, and what happened is that they came back three, three years later and they found out that actually many of the people who had got this information about this relative deprivation and had said that they intended to uh, look for another job, they actually quit their job for another better paid job. And this was at the time of the crisis. So it looks like it's quite um, important. The second um, case study is uh, about digital transparency. It's, um, so it's uh, again about um, uh, transparency about income. So it's about Norway. Again, it was always the case that um, uh, information about gross taxable income of uh, people were, was to be publicly available in Norway. But before digital economy, if you wanted to know about the income, taxable income of, your, of somebody, you had to go to, the, to the, the town hall and ask for the, the registry and then consult the registry. So, of course, it took the transactions costs. I mean, it took you time and you were not going to do this every, every, every five minutes. 
Okay, but uh, in 2010, this information was made publicly available on the internet by the, Norwegi uh, the Norway uh, government. And of course, it made people uh, more likely to observe the incomes of, of others. And so these are the kind of, um, of websites that immediately flourished very rapidly. Uh, so several private uh, websites took the information from the government website and uh, made, designed it in a much uh, more uh, consumer-friendly uh, com consumer way. So you have a lot of this. So it's called um, so taxable income is uh, is catalyster, is catalyster, catalyster. I, I guess I'm, from what I understand. And what happened is there was a fever of looking at people's uh, taxable income. Uh, very rapidly, um, some apps were designed for your iPhone or your computer, where you could know immediately the taxable income of all your friends on Facebook. You could also immediately know the taxable income of all people who are near you, because it's geolocalized. So it was like a, a real fever. So if you look at Google Trends and you look at the, um, the request, so how uh, often do people look for the word skatterlister, so taxable income in Norway, you can see that uh, they look for the, the incomes of other people more often than for the weather. So weather is, <laughs> usually you can look for the weather in the morning, but here you see the weather is, uh, is in violin and the scatterlister in, uh, is, in, uh, is in red, so it's, it's incredible. And it's not happening in Sweden, so it's really because this information has been made available that people are looking for that. So when you look at over time what's happening, so the, the um, people declare their taxable income once a year and, it, and the, the information is, is collected in November. So look at the scatterlister, so the, the uh, intensity of uh, searches for scatterlist, so it's, it's very high, it's a red line, so it's higher than, uh, again, than tax and weather. And there's a peak in November here, in a, well, you don't see what I do, but there's a peak on the, on the red line here. And it's not very, uh, sorry to have to say that, but it's <laughs> so, okay, people look a lot of, for, for instance, these um, researches for porn with the, with the blue line, you see that people look for the taxes, the, growth, the taxable income of their uh, friends, or um, I don't know, co-citizens, more often than they look at uh, several words relating to porn on, uh, on YouTube. <laughs> which is, uh, and I think it's not completely, uh, it's not completely um, uh, absurd to, uh, to compare these two types of words. Because looking at the incomes of somebody has something transgressive in a way. It's, it's, it's a private information, and you want to look at it, you want to know uh, something that maybe in certain countries people don't talk about very easily, so it has something to do with, uh, with, some, with indiscretion. With, um, yeah. So, what, um, so what, yeah, what, what happened during this, um, this period where it was transparent is that when you analyze these surveys of uh, happiness and, uh, where you, and, uh, and this of the ha this household surveys, you see that during, since income uh, became transparent, the association, the statistical association between people's income and their happiness increased a lot. Actually, it increased by one third. So the importance of money in people's life was enhanced by this episode of income transparency. Maybe because of self-image, maybe because you, you, you knew about your income, the uh, incomes of others. So suddenly this dimension was the dimension along which you were uh, ranking yourself uh, relatively to other people. And it's, uh, okay. So the government was a little bit annoyed with this uh, tax, uh, tax looking uh, fever. So they tried to restrict access. They say, okay, uh, now um, if you want to look at the information on other people's income, you have to go back to the government website. Uh, etc., but it didn't affect uh, the intensity. It tried several things, and in the end, the only thing that worked, can you guess? No, it was not money. Give your name, Give your name. exactly. Yeah, the only thing that stopped the, f the, 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 the process was when it was made compulsory for somebody who wanted to look at the income of somebody else to identify herself. And then what happened is that people started looking, not at the incomes of other people, but they started looking at who is, going, who is looking at my income. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, but I think it's super important for the digital economy that um, transparency should be at both ends of the, uh, of the relationship, because otherwise well, we all know uh, how violent people can become when, when they are anonymous and what things they do. 
Okay. So, okay, so transparency is a big issue. We all tend to think spontaneously that transparency is nice because it's a, it, uh, it's a discipline device uh, for behavior, uh, for governance. Uh, if you knew that everybody, everything is transparent, you're going to have um, uh, better rules. But it's clear that also transparency is, uh, enhances this income comparisons, and this, 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 which is this relative uh, um, deprivation phenomena. So, what is, how is the digital economy affecting the intensity of these comparisons? I think it's several different ways. One way is maybe, uh, maybe digital economy or technology increases social segregations. There's a paper showing that, you know, in the, in the 80s, uh, professors, university professors, used to write papers and collaborate with other uh, scholars in their department, in their corridor, maybe in their, in their buildings. So you are here, you are in this university, you work with your colleagues. Since the, the, the internet uh, became, uh, well, see, with the digital economy, this is over. People collaborate with other people who are exactly at the same level of uh, publication rank, notoriety, um, uh, impact uh, factor, etc. No more collaboration spatial, uh, with a spatial set, collaboration with uh, people who are at the same level. So maybe, maybe the digital economy tends to recreate uh, groups of people who are more alike, and you don't interact so much with people, you know, lay people that are around you, but you tend to, so if this is the case, there will be less comparisons because people who interact, they are the same, so there are less gaps. Um, maybe also uh, the extension of all these shared facilities, like uh, shared bicycles, shared, uh, car sharing, uh, the fact that you don't own your own car, well, Obviously, some people still own their own cars, but you know, many people in Paris don't have a car anymore and they just use the, 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 the car sharing system. Same for the bicycles. And if this is going to extend, then it will reduce the, the, the intensity of the importance of comparisons. So it will go in the right direction. And I think it also depends on the type of comparisons. Up to now, I only talked about um, toxic comparisons. So you, you compare to somebody and you, you others are negative. So uh, if I see that somebody is earning more than me, uh, I feel bad. Um, but it's not necessarily the case. Other people's income can also be a source of uh, information about what are the opportunities that are open to me. Uh, I mean, if uh, society is open, if there is some mobility, if the rules are clear in a firm, if you know what, you, what, what it requires for you to get into a certain position, then comparisons can act in a positive way on uh, happiness instead of a negative way. It's also possible. So maybe digital economy and transparency will force organizations to uh, be or, um, this way, to, to be more, uh, you know, to have clearer rules for promotion, for, um, for allocation of uh, people in different positions, uh, maybe. And finally, yeah, concerning the firm, uh, so the digital economy obviously is destroying the, the, the this principle of unity of the Greek tragedy, you remember? Uh, unity of uh, place, unity of, um, of action, and unity of, uh, of time. Uh, so working together in the same place, in the same firm, in the same time, and this is where you uh, interact a lot with your colleagues and you can compare and you can feel de de deprived, jealous, or, or so with the digital economy and working with platforms and everything, you don't necessarily need to be there. You can work from home, you can work in a, um, in a in a in a in a, in a work uh, how is it called in, a, in another place where not necessarily in the same firm. So how is it going to impact uh, comparisons uh, wage comparisons within firms? Maybe it will again lessen the intensity of uh, of comparisons. And I think I'm done. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, so, so I, have, I have a couple of questions, of course. Um, so you talked about this toxic, co toxic comparisons, right? So what I understood from it is when I compare my salary with my colleague and I find out that I earn more, my happiness increases. But when I find out that I earn less, it decreases. But probably it decreases more than it yeah. actually increases, right? So the Much more, yeah. So for instance, in the, um, in the experiment that I talked about, it was totally asymmetric. So if you earn more, you don't really care. But if you earn less, you really care. And this is also mm. related with loss aversion, because losses uh, matter much more, loom much larger than, than gains. 
Yeah, and, and you talked about this aspiration, and so I, I had to, immediately had to think about this phenomena that the new generation, the digital natives, they display their lives, and, and it always looks fantastic, right? They're yeah. always happy, they, may, they have the greatest experiences and wonderful pictures and nice dinners and whatever, and they never share their boredom or their <laughs> depression or their problems or whatever. So what does it actually do with the happiness that you see that all your friends are having a great time mm -hmm. and you are depressed? Yeah. Is, is that decreasing your happiness? Or, or, or yeah. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, there's a French say saying, it's not, only, uh, the, it's not sufficient to be happy, uh, you still need others to be unhappy. So, <laughs> so, so is that your strategy? So if I could make other people unhappy, I am getting happier? And probably it increases the pressure to be happy. And, um, it increases it, the it pressure. It increases the pressure, so it increases the benchmark. And indeed, you compare with this benchmark, and if you are not above, then you feel miserable. So maybe... Uh, it's, so, so are you worried about this Y generation or these millennials? Uh, uh, having this huge expectation to be happy and, 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 and not able to meet that? What, what does it do? I think they just adapt to the, the possibilities that are open to them now. And so they... They deal they with become, it. Uh, sorry? Okay. They no, can deal with it. They become more demanding, and uh, as long as it works, uh, you know. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really worried. You're not worried? No. So you're optimistic that we will be able to handle it? To handle it. So what's, what's your final verdict? Does digital make us happier? I think it does. Or more miserable? <laughs> no, I think it does. I mean, it does not create specific problems. What uh, I've talked about today is uh, it may enhance this problem, but it may also attenuate it. But I think uh, more generally, I mean, it increases the uh, capacity of uh, choosing uh, information. You know, economics is about choice. Digital economy is making uh, um, information more uh, abundant and transparent, Increase, improves the choice. So but I'm surprised well -being. Because, because you showed me this Frans de Waal famous experiment with this monkey, and yeah. the monkey was very happy with a piece of cucumber until he saw that the other monkey got the grape. Yeah, so and then he started to shake his cage and said, well, what the fuck is... Yeah, but then maybe he's going to, maybe yeah. he's going to obtain uh, uh, equal uh, reward for equal work. And because they both give the, the, the rug to the experimenter, so... Yeah, but this, then, so probably if this monkey didn't see the reward of the other Completely. monkey, then it would have been extremely happy with the cucumber. He would have been extremely happy, but now that he has information, he can, uh, he can ask for, uh, equal, for equality. So transparency destroys happiness. That's it destroys happiness and maybe increases uh, fairness. It increases fairness. Yeah. Okay, and then it makes us more happy. Yeah. Maybe there's a question from the audience. Maybe somebody is fascinated by this topic. Let, let's see. I, I know suddenly I make the possibility of asking a question. So. We, we are living in a, in a society where it's more and more transparent. So we will be less and less happy. Yeah. Yeah, if and still you're optimistic. It depends on the society. There, for instance, it depends on the, how you understand uh, the reason why some people uh, fare better than you. If you think it's pure luck, if you think it's just because they were born in the right place in the right time, and you didn't have that chance, then you are going to feel resentment and you're going to be less happy. If you think that you know, it's a word of opportunity, uh, you can very well reach the same position, it's just, uh, it depends on you, then it make make you more happy. For instance, in the transition countries in Eastern Europe in the 90s, um, when you looked at the impact of other people's income on my, your satisfaction, the relationship was positive. So if, if, if a Russian person saw other people who had the same degree of education, worked in the same occupation, in the same region, same age category, and they, they saw this person earning a lot more than them, the, the statistical association was positive. So it, it, because, it was, because ambition was stronger than jealousy. So it depends on the world in which you live. So in, the, in a way, this transparency is going to, uh, to constrain societies to become more, uh, more, more mobile, more uh, 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 meritocratic. So, so is there a business 
opportunity to create a Facebook where actually people share their misery so that everybody feels <laughs> happier. Yeah, it would be nice. Uh, it would I think be it would be a relief also to, <laughs> to complain, you know, with the French way. We, yeah, 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 <laughs> we understand yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that we should do it with the French and the Belgians yeah. because they are already pretty miserable. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, Claudia. you know, I was studying the French... I, 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 well, looking at this data, I found completely by chance that uh, whenever you study these big international data sets and you, you, you look at the relationship between income and happiness and you want to neutralize uh, the fact of living in a, in a country rather than in another. So you introduce this, this country fixed effects. And France is always super negative. I don't know why. So the French, living in France, decreases the probability of being very happy you know, like by, by 20%. Mm. So, no, but it's true. I mean, by very happy, I mean, uh, you know, on the scale from 0 to 10, above 7 so, um, so if the Belgians live the life of the French, not changing anything, the, the average level of happiness would increase by one step on a zero time scale. So, so, here's so the Belgians are happier than the French. So here's something that we should find out while we're here in Brussels, to find out if the French-speaking Belgians are more miserable than the Flemish-speaking <laughs> Belgians. I did, I did. Or am I now touching a, a, a sensitive topic? I don't know. Actually, yeah, they yeah. are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I looked at that. So the French-speaking Belgians are less happy than the, uh, those who speak uh, Dutch, but the, um, the French-speaking Canadians are happier than the English speakers in Canada. And mm -hmm. in Switzerland, uh, it's the Italian-speaking who are less happy than the French-speaking or the German-speaking. So it's not about the, the, the French language. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> so, last question for you, Claudia. Um, so are there any big shifts in this World Happiness Report where a country used to be in the top 10 and then suddenly drops down or the other way around? Or is this quite... No, of course, there are shifts. I mean, there are shifts when well, the economic crisis uh, yeah. or even political distur disturbance. You know, Brazil probably uh, goes down uh, nowadays. Uh, yeah, it moves. Yeah. It moves. Mm, okay. It doesn't move a lot, but it, it moves. Okay. okay, well, thank you very much for sharing your no, insights. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.